Hello and welcome. My name is Kathleen and today I will be starting work on making an 18th century shirt. I've relatively recently gotten interested in dress history and historical sewing. I've made a couple of 18th century garments with varying degrees of original practice. Um, and I thought this would be a good next project for a couple of reasons. For one thing, it's, in my opinion, it's a good mix of new and familiar skills. Also, I don't have access to a sewing machine right now. I am at school and this garment would have been made entirely by hand at the time. And that's something I can do here. So that's great. Uh, and also, I just really want a cool piratey looking shirt and how much more piratey can you get than the golden age of piracy. Because I am planning to wear this shirt as part of my very 21st century wardrobe, I am going to be making some slight changes to how the original pattern would have been made. In the 18th century, men's shirts would have reached to about the knees, but I want mine to be the length of a modern shirt, so that is one change I'm going to be making. I'm also going to be making the chest slit shorter because I want to be able to wear this shirt without a layer under it or over it, but I will need to be careful to strike a balance between getting that short enough, but also being able to put the shirt on over my head. For my fabric, I will be using a medium weight white linen from Burnley and Trowbridge. And the pattern and instructions I will be primarily following uh, come from, and get ready for me to horribly mispronounce a bunch of French words, come from the website marquise.day from an article called Making a Men's Shirt which is a translation of the pattern diagrams and instructions in the book Le Art de Tolore, published by Garsalt in the 1760s. So if you want to know more or want to try this for yourself, I would definitely recommend that as a really helpful resource. I'm going to start marking things on my fabric. If I was doing the real, really historically accurate methods, I should be drawing a string, um, which is removing a single thread of the linen to then cut on. But um, I'm gonna be lazy and mark it with pins and then probably pencil or chalk and then cut along those lines. It won't, I know it won't be as accurate um, and I will perhaps regret this decision later, but, it's what I've decided to do, and I'm gonna go with it. Okay, I've got all my pieces marked on my fabric. It's not as precise as drawing a thread would have been, but I'm fine with it. I, I might regret it later, we will see. After cutting the fabric, the first step is making the sleeves. I am starting by pinning, leaving eight centimeters, or a little over three inches open at one end, uh, for the cuff, and on the other end, I'm leaving about five inches open, two and a half for the gusset, and two and a half that will be cut off later to make the sleeve the right length. Next, I'm marking the half inch seam allowance. Ideally, I'd be able to sew in a straight line, but for hand stitching, I like to draw myself a line to follow. I'm using a back stitch for all the seams in this project, and once that's done, I am trimming one side of the seam allowance and finishing the seam using the turning and felling method as specified by Garsalt. The raw edges of the cuff opening are also turned under twice and felled down. I didn't get any footage of inserting the underarm gusset, but the same method is used as for the neck gusset, which I will be explaining shortly. I finished making the two sleeves, so I messed up and put the gussets and the um, wrist, the slip for the cuff in the wrong side, so I'll need to fix the length when I put the cuffs on, but that won't be too big of a problem. They're just a little long right now, but yeah. 
Okay, so I'm in my dorm's craft room so that I could get some pressing done out of range of the kitten. Um, but anyway, this next part had me really confused when I was doing my research. Just from reading a couple different sources, I was completely lost. It took a lot of pictures and videos and like staring at examples like, what? To figure out even what I was supposed to be doing. So I will make an effort to explain this clearly. So this is what this piece of the shirt is going to end up looking like. I made a practice one uh, before even attempting to explain how it's done. So I started by making a mark in the middle of the short side and I drew a line that's a little shorter than the edge of the gusset to account for seam allowance. I'm going to go ahead and cut along the line. Next, I'm going to pin these two pieces together, right sides together, uh, fitting this corner, one corner of the gusset, into the end of the slit on the shoulder piece. Now, I didn't mark my seam allowances on the first one, so they are pretty inconsistent, but they are roughly 3 eighths of an inch, so that's what I'm going to aim for on the second one, but they don't need to be super precise on this step, so I'm not too worried about it. I just need to clip the seam allowances around this pesky little corner and then press it and I'll have both shoulder pieces all done. So, yay! The next step is cutting the opening for the collar. First, I am marking the center of the body where the shoulder should be. For the neck opening, I'm going to make a line across where that fold was, leaving about 15 centimeters on either side for the shoulders. In the center of that line, I'm going to mark out where the chest slit will be. I am making my chest slit about 13 centimeters long or about 5 inches. This leaves me with a T-shaped mark to cut along. And let me tell you, this was stressful. <laughs> Seams you can rip out and redo, but once you have cut the fabric, there is no going back, especially for a big hole right in the middle like this. After cutting, I hemmed the chest slit in the same manner as the cuff openings. Right down at the point of the chest slit, there's not enough fabric to turn over twice. So for now, the edges are left raw, but I will be going back and finishing it with a buttonhole stitch, likely when I am making the buttonholes. Now the process of pinning the neck gusset into the neck slit of the shirt is actually kind of weird. It was another step that took me a little bit to figure out. So you take the point of the gusset that is opposite where the shoulder piece is attached and you actually put the right side of the gusset to the wrong side of the shirt. And the reason we do this is because later this will be folded over like this and it will encase those seams and have this piece, the shoulder piece lying against the right side of the shirt. So it's a little weird, but we do pin right side to wrong side in this case, which is relatively unusual. Another note is that where, okay, where there's this seam where the shoulder piece and the neck gusset attach, you only pin and sew up to there. So only along the side of the square, not along this piece that will be needed to fold back. Okay, now that this is all pinned in, I'm going to grab my thread and use a back stitch to stitch it in place. Okay, this next bit is pretty fiddly, but I'm going to try to show it the best I can. So basically, what we need to do is fold this over and pin all this down so that 
this nice fold is then part of the roundness uh, of the neck hole. And this is pinned down with the edges turned over so it can be running stitched down. Okay, I have both of these pinned on, and now I'm going to secure them by doing a running stitch around the edge, and we'll be ready to move on. The past few days have been, shall we say, interesting. Uh, I am currently in isolation, at least until I get the results of my COVID test back. Hopefully, only till then, fingers crossed. Uh, and since I am caught up on my assignments for now and can't leave my bedroom, um, I'm planning to get a lot of sewing done this weekend. I didn't get any footage of attaching the collar, which I got done yesterday, but never fear, the exact same method is used to attach the wristbands, which I will be doing shortly. So if you are actually watching this video to learn how to make a shirt and not just because you're one of my friends, um, don't worry, it is the exact same steps, but on the neck opening instead of the wrist opening, so it'll be fine. So for attaching the sleeve to the cuff, I am following the instructions from a video Historical Fashion Tutorial Series Gathering Shirt to Wristband from the Burnley and Trowbridge Company YouTube channel. So I will try to remember to put a link to that somewhere. But yeah, let's get started. First things first, I am prepping the wristbands. I should have sewn the ends closed right sides together and then turned them, but I, for some reason, decided to press the seam allowances under first, so I'm improvising and just closing the ends with a slip stitch. Next, I am making two rows of gathering stitches. These stitches should be as close to even as possible, both consistent in stitch length within the row and making sure the two rows line up with each other. Because of my current skill level at hand stitching, these are not going to be perfect, but I am still doing my best. On the collar, I made the mistake of using a white for the gathering thread, which made these stitches incredibly difficult to see. Since then, I found this spool of purple, so that should make this process a lot easier. The gathering stitches will come out after the cuff is attached, so it doesn't matter that I'm using a contrasting thread. If you're wondering why I have a pillow on my lap, this is, to my knowledge, a method used by 18th century tailors to prevent neck and back strain. Sitting cross-legged creates proper posture, and the pillow raises the work closer to your face so you don't have to hunch down to see it. Next up is gathering. I currently have 57 centimeters of sleeve that I need to gather into 19 centimeters of wristband. So let's get going. I've used pins to mark half and quarter points on both the sleeve and the wristband to help me line up the pieces and get the gathers more even. I will be gathering the sleeves in these four sections to make the task more manageable, pinning as I go. The cuff is attached, like many parts of this project, with tiny, tiny whip stitches. I am switching back to white thread because these are permanent stitches and will be visible from the outside of the garment. Starting on the inside of the cuff, though honestly, this is arbitrary, I'm making one stitch per gather, which means if you think of the gathers as hills and valleys, I'm catching just the peak of each hill and then catching the bottom edge of the wristband. The Burnley and Trowbridge video explains this much better than I am, so if you want to know how to do this specifically, I'd recommend you check that out. 
Once I've finished the inside of the cuff, I flip it over and repeat for the outside. This is actually a very secure way to attach cuffs and collars because the valleys on the inside of the sleeve are the hills on the outside and vice versa. On the second cuff, I did put the pins perpendicular to the edge of the wristband instead of parallel, which I found works much better. It held everything in place, but didn't smush the gathers while I was trying to sew. Last but not least, it is time to remove the gathering threads and give it a press. So I just finished sewing on the second cuff, the other sleeve, and I've realized something. I've made an error. Uh, I don't know if you remember, that won't be too big of a problem. Um, when I made the sleeves and sewed up the seam on the sleeves, I accidentally had made the sleeve too long and I was planning to remeasure it and cut off about two inches at the wrist end before sewing the cuff on. I did not do that. Um, and so now I'm kind of like, hmm, debating what to do. Um, Yes, I have a couple options. I could take off the cuffs and cut off those two inches and start over. Um, I really don't want to do that because the cuffs and the collar, that those sorts of steps are a lot of work. Um, and especially since I've already gotten the gathering threads out, it just nightmare. So I don't want to do that. My other option would be to cut off the two inches at the, like, armpit end, but with the gusset already in, I would either have to basically cut out the gusset so, or take out the gusset and seam rip and fix things. It'd be a lot of work, and especially since I've already turned and felled the seams, the seam allowance on one end is already clipped super short. So I don't have a lot of room to work with there. Um, so my other option would just be to have sleeves that are too long. Which at the moment, and perhaps this is laziness speaking, but at the moment that is what I am leaning towards. So we will see where this goes. <laughs> I, funny story, I don't have any safety pins. The closest thing I could find is this Bob Ross pin that says we don't make mistakes, only happy accidents, which I think is very appropriate for this situation. But anyway, I do think I've found a solution to the sleeve length issue. I have gone ahead and pinned one of the sleeves to the body of the shirt, taking out about two inches at this end, which is essentially no more gusset, which the gusset is originally intended to give you a good range of motion in the arms, but since I am significantly smaller than the people Garcelt likely had in mind when he was creating this pattern and instructions in his book, um, I still have plenty of room to move my arms because there's plenty of extra fabric in the body of the, sh the shirt and in the sleeves. So I was worried that that would be an issue taking out the gusset, but it's fine. So I'm going to go ahead and cut off the gussets and go ahead and get these sleeves attached. So I didn't manage to get any good footage of actually pinning and sewing the sleeves, but I will just real quick go through what I did. So I started with attaching the sleeves before I'd sewn up the sides of the shirt. This is kind of backwards of what you are supposed to do, but because I've had to change the sleeves so much from the original pattern, I didn't quite trust that it would end up lining up the same. So I decided to just put the sleeves in first rather than trying to wrestle them into an opening that they might not fit in later. Because I needed to change the length so much, I marked my new stitching line in pencil, always on the wrong side of the fabric, 
and used that as a guide while pinning. I could have trimmed off all the extra fabric then, just leaving the normal seam allowance, but I decided to wait just in case anything happened. I didn't want to regret cutting the fabric too soon. Once the sleeves were in, I just stitched up the side of the shirt, simple enough, and flat felled all the seams. I did have to decide which way to turn the seam allowances on the sleeves and pretty much arbitrarily decided to turn them towards the sleeve, um, meaning where felling stitches are visible from the outside is on the sleeve rather than the body of the shirt. Um, I don't have any historical basis for this decision, it's just what I decided to do. And while I was working on it, I remembered having the exact same dilemma when I was making my shift from the same era. So I decided I needed to do some more research. After looking at many very zoomed in pictures of extant shirts, you know, as you do, uh, it seems that I should have done this the other way around. Though I will say the only pictures that I could find of this area of the shirt that were clear enough to see the individual felling stitches were all pictures from the same, same shirt, from the same museum. So that is not enough evidence to say by any means that this was a universal practice. For all I know, it could have just been as arbitrary then as it was for me. And I really would like to solve this mystery or um, at least to do some more digging before my next 18th century project. But sleeve sleuthing aside, it is time to hem. I am making a relatively wide hem because the shirt was quite long to begin with, turning twice to encase the raw edge and securing in place with whip stitches. I tend to do all my hems by hand, even on my machine sewn projects. I just like how it looks better, so. This was a very familiar process. There are a few miscellaneous things left to do. First is finishing the chest slit. I don't have any footage of this step, so have fun watching me hem some more. I used the alternate method described by Garsalt of covering the raw edge with buttonhole stitches. I should have used buttonhole twist or embroidery floss, but since I am still in quarantine, this is my only option and I decided to go ahead with my itty bitty buttonhole stitches. Chances are I'll go over this again eventually with the proper kind of thread, but I'm satisfied with it for now. Finally, buttons and buttonholes. I've decided to leave the buttons off the collar for now since I am far more likely to wear it open than buttoned in everyday wear. If I ever get around to making a waistcoat or something else from the era and want to wear this in a more strictly historical outfit, that is something I can add relatively easily later. I had planned to make my own thread buttons to fasten the cuffs, a skill I was rather looking forward to learning, but only after I had finished the wristbands did I discover that I had made them a few centimeters too short. Chances are I forgot to add the seam allowance to my measurements. Garcelt's pattern is a bit odd in that all of the measurements he gives already include seam allowance except the cuffs and collar, which for me both ended up slightly smaller than I anticipated. I have fairly small wrists, so theoretically I could still put the buttons on as originally instructed, and the cuffs would fit, but they would just barely fit, and I prefer a more loose, flowy feel, so for now I am completely diverging from historical accuracy and going with these small white buttons and little loops to hold them in place. Because I'm not cutting the fabric at all to make a buttonhole, I can easily change my mind and do something else later if I find a solution I like better. How did I make these loops, you ask? I just made it up as I went, and it was a huge pain. Very difficult and fiddly. I am not even going to bother explaining how to do it because my advice is don't. Just make your cuffs longer than you think they need to be and make buttonholes. Buttonholes can be a pain, but they are infinitely easier than whatever this is. But with these loops in place, the shirt is done. It's a far cry from a direct reproduction, but 
I can't say I'm any less proud than I would be of a technically historically accurate garment. Following our modern patterns, I don't think I've ever made something that strictly followed every instruction. I always mess something up or change something. I have to imagine that's how it was for home sewers of the past, too. To anyone who, like me, is a relative beginner to historical sewing, I'd encourage you to remember this when you get frustrated or when everything seems to be going wrong. Historical accuracy isn't just about things like stitches per inch, it's also about ingenuity, problem solving. The people who made and who wore these clothes were real people just like you. It doesn't take long of looking at extant garments to start noticing weird darts or quick fixes. These people and their sewing weren't perfect. And neither are you. And that's okay. Like my mom has always said, it is not a good sewing project if you don't have to use the seam ripper. So go forth, friends, in all your historical or modern or somewhere in between glory. Happy sewing.